Between July 1969 and December 1972, a dozen humans walked on the surface of the moon. It hasn't happened since, but now there's a new moon race to set foot once again on the lunar surface. In this special space-themed episode of Gareth Jones on Speed, we ask, who will be the next to reach the moon? And when will it happen? Hello, welcome to Gareth Jones on Speed, episode 482. How did that happen? I'm Gareth, he's Zog. Hello. And joining us for this episode, not only a great friend of ours, but an award-winning BBC journalist, one half of the Space Boffins podcast, and a massive Star Trek fan. Will you welcome, please, Sue Nelson. Hey, Sue. Woo, hello. How are you doing? I'm living well and prospering, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, see? There you go. we got the right person for the gig. You know exactly what to say. So you, like us, keep a keen eye on what's going on or not going on in space. You do it for not just Space Boffins podcast, but for your own interest too. You are a proper space nut, aren't you? I am. And it, it's started like many people of my era as a child with the moon landings. Yeah. And then it was Star Trek, actually, that really got me into space as well, because I watched it as a kid and was an addict. And I love the fact that there were women on the deck yeah. and um, were going down as scientists and were, you know, equal to the captain. Sometimes they got to snog him even better because I had a crush <laughs> on Captain Kirk. And, and then I, after studying physics at university, and funnily enough, I wanted to do astrophysics at one point and didn't. I was lucky enough in that with my job as a science journalist, I could incorporate space stuff into that because it comes under, you know, space science and what have you. So when I was a BBC science correspondent, I actually effectively got paid to do something I loved, which was report on space missions. And since then, it's not just been professional, like with the European Space Agency and working with Zog or Paul, as I know. And um, it's been a sort of, you know, I, I just can't help myself, whether it's traveling on my own money to go and see eclipses or um, I went on a NASA social um, uh, quite a while ago to go and see um, an SLS launch. Oh, oh. Which was amazing. For work, I got to see an Atlas IV launch in 1999 and oh. um, saw a SpaceX launch uh, just before the pandemic. So, yeah, <sighs> funnily enough, I've got so many friends who are so into space, be it the engineering side or the exploration side or the science side, that... I realise that I'm like a a lightweight compared to them. And I include you in this one, actually, Gareth. No, it's impossible. They know so much that I just feel, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Sue, so you're way more up to date on me. The only stuff I know about space really is, you know, the, the names and dates of birth of every single member of the Apollo space programme and which flights they flew on. You know, beyond that, I'm a bit sketchy. Well, this is going to blow your mind then because last week I went to the Moonwalkers exhibition in London for Space Boffins to do an interview with Chris Riley, who's one of the co-writers with Tom Hanks. We know Chris. Of the exhibition. And Chris sent me an email and said, actually, he said, um, Jerry Griffin, who's the flight director from all the Apollo missions, Jerry Griffin's going to be there that day. Do you want to oh. meet him? Do you want to interview him? So I sat and watched that Moonwalkers exhibition next to Jerry oh. Griffin. And I kid you not, oh. I actually... I had a tear in my eye. Of course you did. I'm not surprised. You know when you suddenly see yourself from outside your body yep. and realise this lovely guy, and particularly when you see inside Mission Control, and I just thought, oh, oh my goodness, this is this is this is unbelievable. And that's when you realise that your job and your passions coincide, and you feel so lucky. I have a comparable story to that, Sue, which I will share in a minute. I just want to talk to Zog about having Sue on because. So you and Sue work together. You shoot, edit and do live coverage of events for ESA, don't you? That's right. Yeah. Uh, European Space Agency, as, uh, uh, as Sue mentioned, we've, we've made a bunch of 
films them about some truly wonderful missions. I mean, I, Rosetta, I think, was a particular privilege to work on, not just being part of the process of communicating what the mission was about and what it was doing, but to be there for uh, a couple of the live events, the rendezvous and the landing on Comet 67P, uh, just to remind people, the Rosetta mission being the European Space Agency mission that landed a probe on a comet. And what an extraordinary feat that was. And to be there at ESA's control centre when that event was unfolding was such a privilege. It was you know, extra, it was a wonderful, yeah, real career highlight. Wasn't wasted on you, so I'm going to love to have been there with you for that. Okay, let's talk about some space highlights that are occurring at the moment. Now, Peregrine, let's talk about this. This was a private mission, if you like, to land on the moon, uncrewed. It was deploying a bunch of payloads, I think 10 payloads in total. It was run by a company called Astrobotic. Not Astrobiotic, which is a sort of yogurt, I think. But Astrobotic had a great launch on the new Vulcan Centaur, uh, which is a debut launch. I mean, important mission to go on a debut launch of a new vehicle using Blue Origin's B4 motors. Burns blue, beautiful in the sky. Oh, great launch, but unfortunately... Peregrine uh, had an anomaly with a valve and it won't be able to do a soft landing on the moon, which is a a great shame. Uh, And there are other missions uh, as well, of course. Intuitive Machines are about to launch one. Um, Mid-February, I think, another uh, private contract issued by NASA to a company to deliver payloads to the moon. I think they call it the CLPS. I think that's what it's called the um, Commercial Lunar Payload Service or something. One thing I wasn't clear about is how Peregrine um, and this next commercial mission, how they relate to the bigger NASA crewed missions to the moon, Artemis missions, how they fit into and support that. Are they important to the success of landing astronauts on the moon or is this a bit of a sideshow? Well, NASA have all these commercial contracts with with different companies. So they are encouraging commercial companies as as they've always worked with companies to actually effectively to me I I mean, you know, these are my words not theirs. It's almost like a like backup plans I would say in that they've got other alternatives to what they're doing because as we know Artemis is 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 still ongoing but NASA recently announced that the are delays which to be honest everyone expected of course. it always was an ambitious uh, date yeah. that they planned but it's quite exciting really because it does mean that you've sort of doubled your chances of doing science and what you want to do on the moon and it will effectively once you've got your Artemis missions are up and running and hopefully the intuitive machines lander will be successful it then speeds everything up, Mm -hmm. doesn't it, towards Mm -hmm. if you've got things going on in parallel. Because they are related, because there are NASA experiments on the intuitive machine. So it's giving them data. Yeah, Yeah. so it's it's giving them data that that, that will help, yeah, that will give them better information. About the lunar surface. Yeah, that will characterise the the landing area. Artemis announced it was going to the South Pole, which, again, we'd all ex- expected because that's where the, it's likely, you know, to have your, your, your get water. your water ice. Yeah. You, it's more mm-hmm. likely where you can set up a lunar base. And um, Nova C, the intuitive machines, IM-1 mission, uh, which will go up in a, in a few weeks, that's heading to the lunar surface and the, on the South Pole, and that will deliver five NASA science experiments. So they're all looking at not just the environment to check it, it all interacts with with each other because I am two. If I am one's a success, you've still got I am two, which is the you know the next one, which is just a few months later, and that's got this hopper, this mm-hmm. micronova hopper that's going to hop. I kid you not, like a pogo stick yep. across the moon, up to fifteen miles, and it will go into shadowed areas 
in the craters where ice might be. Now, it also aims to send us the first pictures inside these shadowed craters. Come on. And it's got an ice drill. So that's going to demonstrate technology that you can get various compounds out of the lunar subsurface so that you can then produce water and and rocket fuel you you know you want to use that frozen ice etc all plays into setting up a permanent base on the moon because what do you need when you're there you need fuel you need water and you can't always have service missions going back and forth back and forth back and forth if you've got the resources there to actually um use it so it's it's yes it's it's commercial but it's it's all intertwined in helping, I think, effectively a future lunar economy. So I think two things are happening here. There's a commercial necessity to get to the moon, to exploit it, if I'm being honest, before China does. And second of all, many, many, many years ago, NASA fundamentally changed its whole structure. They went to a series of missions that were simpler, lighter, faster, cheaper, That was the philosophy. Rather than throwing your all in into one complex mission, there were lots of little throwaways. And each of those was a learning program. And that helped us get to the position we are now where we can, I say we, humankind, can land vehicles and fly vehicles on Mars. So this whole explosion, like you said, developing lunar economy. Please tell me you're watching this for all mankind on uh, <laughs> Apple Plus. Yeah? Big thumbs up. Yes, I am, but I'm a bit bit behind. So okay. no, spoilers. no spoilers. No spoilers. I view that as a prequel to Star Trek Enterprise, basically. <laughs> it's, it, you know, we're getting, this is the early days now of exploitation of the solar system. It could also be a prequel to The Expanse you might argue, but it's really displaying how we might commercially exploit the moon. And there's a great interest in it and everybody's going there. And really that's what Artemis is about, isn't it? Yes. I I think the China aspect I think is really interesting because I think it was just yesterday or two days ago that Reuters had a piece out And you had Bill Nelson from NASA, which is funny because that's my late father's name. Oh, (laughs) of course. Bill Nelson, I think, Dad. (laughs) Well, for me, I always hear the song Dreaming Colour by Bill Nelson, who uh, it was in Bebop Deluxe, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, whose brother was in Fiat Lux. I didn't know that. (laughs) I have a mate who's in Fiat Lux. We'll we'll have that conversation. Sorry, we've gone way off topic. Sorry, Sue. I have no idea what you two are talking about now, (laughs) but there you go. I'll stick to my my version of Bill Nelson, or my second version of Bill Nelson, is that, you know, he he was very, very clear on that they were going to beat the Chinese. But it was the Reuters piece actually basically called it a moon race with China. And I thought, whoa, and that coupled with Bill Nelson's, say, quite aggressive stance of no one, we're going to beat them. I thought, whoa, it's on. I know that politically the countries are on different sides of a coin, uh, but China's been doing really well. You know, it's already landed on the moon three times, yeah, I think. Since, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ch- the Chinese three, four and five missions. They've done a sample return. They went to the yeah, far side of the moon. The far side, the first nation to, to do that. So. Yeah. Actually, the Chinese are sort of quite quietly, oh, yeah. but efficiently are doing really well. They've got plans. They want to set up a permanent habitat on the South Pole as well. Yeah, of course. And I've heard American space journalists genuinely, I mean, I don't know, what, you know, it's partly nationalism as well and pride in their Apollo program and their achievements so far, but genuinely sound worried that the Chinese will get there there first. And personally, maybe it's being a European, I I sort of don't feel that nationalistic Uh towards it. You want to leave the planet as a race, as a humankind, yeah? Yeah, I I just want to see it as... and, And China have actually quite surprisingly said last year that they wanted to do international yeah, collaboration. But NASA's not allowed to collaborate with China. Yeah, but China got other countries to collaborate. Um, yeah. And recently, NASA reported that they signed an agreement with the United Arab Emirates and the UAE are going to build an airlock for Gateway, mm-hmm. which will be the permanent sort of orbiting craft around the moon, which will act as, you know, helping the astronauts 
the Artemis astronauts eventually as a sort of pit stop to get uh, down to the lunar surface. So there are these what would previously be seen as unusual collaborations going on. And, and of course, you've got India. If just a few months ago, they had a, a moon lander and a robotic rover on the, on the South Pole. And they did it cheap, didn't they? What was it, 80 yeah. quid that mission cost or yeah. something? So, so, you know, it's it's no longer, I think maybe the Americans, the reality is it, it's no longer, it was just US and Russia, in you know, in the mm-hmm. space race. And when it comes to the moon landings, it was just the US. It was just the US and they mm-hmm. were amazing. But it's not the same anymore. So many different countries are in it. And... This is, I like like you said humanity. It's 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 so exciting, and I I welcome whoever gets there, but you have to look at their reasons for doing so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 and it's all commercial, of course it is. So you and I have, I think, a different perception of the Chinese space program because of our interest in road cars. Now I remember when we started this podcast 19 years ago for the first five or six years that we made it we made jokes principally about Chinese cars that were awful terribly built ripoffs of other people's cars and just didn't really work terribly well but here we are today where the change from internal combustion engines to electric cars has given China their Apollo moment the goals were changed right the rules were were changed we've all got to go EV and now China has overtaken so many European and a couple of American manufacturers with their technology in electric cars so so the point I'm trying to make is we really shouldn't be surprised that China's really good at space stuff no and as Sue says they appear to get on and do it uh, with minimal fuss. They seem to hit all of their objectives in terms of what they're doing with space. And I think 2030 is the year they've suggested they might land people on the moon. I think you're right, yep. As we're talking today, and we should maybe get on to the the status of NASA's Artemis program, but I think Artemis 3 has now been pushed back to is it 25, uh, late, late, 26, late 25? I think. 26 even. Yeah. It doesn't seem that unlikely that Artemis 3 will slip further back and it's getting then closer and closer to when China has suggested they'll be landing on the moon. And it wouldn't surprise me if, if those dates are going to get closer and closer to where it really will be a, yeah. <laughs> a, a, a race. You know, we really will be a biting our nails, seeing who's going to make it. Um, but I can't imagine, though, I don't see what's in it politically for one nation to take, which I don't think either of them would, would take shortcuts in order to get there first, because it's not like it was with Russia and the rest of the Western world and the Cold War and everything, you know, I think politically things are very different. And although, yes, there are still a lot of suspicion about China and technology and spyware and and et cetera, and I think there are very different, um, in some cases, attitudes towards human rights amongst certain aspects of society, I don't think either country will sacrifice astronauts just to get there first or take those risks yeah i mean that's an interesting point and i I think i think you're probably i'm sure you're right about that the cost today of losing people uh, on a mission like that is is much higher it it looks much much worse than it would have done in the apollo era for the united states or for russia it's less of a heroic noble failure and sacrifice scrutiny as well there's more scrutiny in terms of why are we spending this much money yeah when in both countries as in everywhere pretty much with the state you know the economy and particularly post-pandemic when many countries have got a cost of living crisis Mm -hmm. so if you're spending money on something that can if you're hungry and you can't pay your bills seem like a superfluous you yeah. Know, Whereas dream. we we all know that investment in space technology 
helps the economy on Earth, and every penny spent on a space mission is spent on Earth. It educates, it informs, it gives in the future the possibility to have, I don't know, unlimited resources from the asteroid exactly, belt. Exactly, but if you're struggling to pay your bills... Yeah, yeah. It doesn't feel like yeah, it doesn't yeah, feel like course. that. And you're in <laughs> short term and not long term, which is can I pay my bill? Yeah. Can I be warm? Mm. So yeah, so yeah, that that makes any failure have more yeah. of a importance on it. One thing I wonder about, and I, I wonder if if you could speak to this little Sue, but I wonder if is the approach that NASA is taking with Artemis is it a little bit too complicated? Are they being a bit too ambitious in what they're trying to do? Because when I was looking into the Starship side of it, because as I, as, I, as I understand the mission plan for Artemis 3, which is when they will land people on the moon again, this is going to involve not just launching an Orion capsule on an SLS rocket, but it, that will then rendezvous in lunar orbit with... Uh, a SpaceX Starship, a special version of the Starship that will take the crew to the lunar surface. The HLS, the Human Landing System, they call that one, don't they? Right, yeah. correct. And to get the Starship uh, to its position in lunar orbit where they can do that rendezvous, it will take a lot of Starship launches to do the part of the mission that involves fueling up the Starship HLS, I think, in Earth orbit. Correct. They're going, to, they're going to build this kind of fueling depot yep. that is going to take, you know, something like, it, it, you know, of the order of 20 or so Starship launches, and it's going to require, you know, refueling in orbit, which we haven't done yet. We haven't tested this yet. There are a lot of parts of this. Is this, is this too ambitious? I wouldn't say it was too ambitious because you have to be ambitious in order to do this. And you have to move on from existing technology. We, you can't just do the same as that has, has gone on before. But yes, there are definitely a lot of things to get right. But then I think that's the sort of the wow factor ab about it yep. because you've mm. got your Starship rocket will be reusable have 33 Raptor engines on it. It's it, taller, more powerful than a Saturn V and an SLS. Woohoo! What they're attempting has never been done before. So you've got this, like you said, you've got this added extra bit where instead of just, you know, with the Apollo missions, you've got your Apollo capsule at the top and, you know, it turns around, <laughs> gets onto the lander and then, it, you know, you go down onto the surface. You've got this extra bit of a, of a Starship rocket it's interesting that the orion capsule um i have been inside an exact mock-up of one in um, nasa and it's exactly like it it looks it's just like a bigger a giant apollo it's a five-seat yeah. apollo yeah. isn't yeah. it yeah. The, it's like five yeah five meters across but yeah. you know you can take four astronauts not three in it and you won't be so cramped but as we know the starship you know they've had two failures on launch having said that a lot of people who know a lot more about this in terms of the engineering and that are still saying, yes, but this is incredible what they have done oh, yeah. and what they have done no so far. Yeah. So there is more behind just seeing something go wrong on, on screen. There's a lot more to it. The first flight, yeah, you had four minutes into liftoff. Um, you got some problems with some of the Raptor engines. The FAA did an investigation and they said, you know, they couldn't go ahead with the second one until it was what was 63 corrective actions mm -hmm. before the next. And they'd launch. already implemented 57 of them before they got the report, they said, yeah. didn't oh, they? Oh, well, SpaceX said they did a thousand. Well, right. So, yeah. Really? Well. <laughs> Which immediately made me think, hmm, if you don't, that opens up more things to go. But, you know, let's forget about that. And, and like you said about the number of repellent launches and you know that would potentially need there are some dis there's some dispute about the number of tanker launches that they're going to need and this has just been said quite recently mm -hmm. because originally um spacex said oh we you'd need no more than eight yeah. to act as this sort of propellant depot carrier to and from these tanker launches to fuel you know then they settled at 16 in the end didn't yeah they? and yeah. then nasa 
said, nah, nah, yeah. it's going to be the high teens. Well, high teens, that's double more than what's yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With the whole technology necessary to transfer propellant from one container to another in a zero-G environment, in a vacuum, is going to be tested on the next SpaceX Starship launch, Integrated Test Launch 3, where... They're not actually going to be able to transfer between two separate spacecraft, but they are going to move some fuel from the header tank in the Starship, you know, the upper stage of the combined vehicle, to the main propellant tank and then use it. And this will be the first time that propellant's ever been moved around, as I understand it, from one tank to another. I mean, a lot's riding on this third yeah. test flight because the second one failed in November. But having said failed an enormous amount went right. Yeah. And they've only just announced, actually, that what caused it, yeah. it was a propellant dump. They had to dump some liquid oxygen, but SpaceX have said they actually had to vent it because there was no payload on board. And if there had been a payload on board, they wouldn't have had to vent it. That wouldn't have caught fire, and actually it would have gone into orbit. Um, so they are pretty confident that, Actually, and I've heard others and seen others comment commentate on it that actually a huge amount went right on that second um, launch. But yes, it is very de dependent on that. Otherwise, we'll have more delays. To be clear, I mean, I I, I think I, I I have a lot of faith in SpaceX's engineering competence and ability, and I I think it's interesting in this context to let's say compare them with with Boeing, a company that's been involved in aerospace and space for a very long time. Currently in the news because doors keep falling off their aircraft. But at the same time, a few years ago, Boeing and SpaceX were both awarded contracts to develop crew capsules to take people to the ISS. Uh, and I think the, the Boeing contract was about 50% bigger than the contract that was awarded to SpaceX. And Boeing was developing their Starliner capsule. CST-100 Starliner. Excellent. Uh, and SpaceX... Crew Dragon. And as of today, uh, there have been, what, a dozen or so Crew Dragon flights to the yep. ISS that have all gone beautifully. And Boeing has still not flown Starliner with a crew. So SpaceX, you know, did the job better for less money. And Boeing still hasn't done the job. So it seems like, you know, the engineering competence of SpaceX is, you know, top notch. Let's also recognise that, yes, they've, they've developed Starship, a reusable space vehicle, as well as reusing all their Falcon 9. So, yeah, this is a very competent company. But it still seems like there are a lot, an awful lot of moving pieces, an awful lot of elements to Artemis that maybe make one worry about whether there's a bit too much going on there. But, but I think I, but you mustn't about... forget Blue Origin as well, because NASA's right. commissioned them to do a lunar lander design called Blue Moon. <laughs> Blue Moon. <laughs> and let's not forget that Vulcan that launched the other day was running Blue Origin's B2 engines, oh, are yes. they called? Yeah. Right. Because right. they can't use... B4. B4. That's it, B4s. Mm. Because they can't use Russian... That's right. uh, motors anymore, you know, and, the, and that's mm. what's driven the move towards SpaceX as well. America is trying to withdraw itself from the, the, the cheap teat of Zoya's launches. You know, it, it, it was the only way they could get to space for a long time. But SpaceX launches are cheap. If you want to launch a satellite, yeah. cheapest way to do it is to put it on a SpaceX rocket. It's yeah. much cheaper than any other option. I, I forget, Third I mean, of the price. It costs them a third of what it costs ULA, as I understand, to launch. Yeah, it depends on the mission profile, depends on, you know, how much you're throwing away. Some SpaceX missions, they don't recover the uh, booster stages on some Falcon Heavy missions. And that, of course, allows you to put more stuff in orbit, but you don't recover the booster, so it becomes more expensive that way. So there is a, a quite a range. But yes, yeah, SpaceX is absolutely slashing the price in in an area, right? Stay with me on this. What is it they say? Space is big. You won't just believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down to the chemists, but that's just peanuts to space, right? The opening to... Um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Guide to the Galaxy, yeah. However, 
inspired by something I heard from Astrobiotics, the yogurt manufacturing <laughs> Astro Robot people, Astro Robotics. They said the final line in their one of their updates of Peregrine when it was all going wrong was space is hard. I think we could rewrite that Douglas Adams thing to be something like space is hard. You won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly hard it is. I mean, you may think it's difficult designing and engineering a Formula One race car, but that's simple compared to space. It is really hard. We come back, Sue, to what you said about harvesting data and Zog. You agreed. You know, all these... I won't say failures, but missions that don't play out as they fully were intended to. And I don't think there has ever been a single mission without some kind of, okay, let's change the plan as we go. You know, we are gathering data at a ferocious rate now. And this whole approach of NASA to contract out developing and engineering to small, agile, blue sky thinking companies some with some amazing funding which hasn't come from the military is doing exactly what i hope we're doing uniting the planet the moon race was the third world war force in outer space rather than the soviet union and the u.s firing missiles at each other they played a game of planetary high jump or something like that whose technology is the best and you know what? It pulled us together, didn't it? That was one of the things that diffused that war tension. And for a long time, the West and Russia had quite close relations. It started with the Apollo Soyuz test project. We couldn't believe it when that happens. I'm an optimist. Are you, we've got plenty of time to talk about this. Are you guys optimistic for what the philosophy of planetary exploration can do? for humankind? Will it move us again away from the brink of war? Well, I am a, a sort of a natural optimist. So I always think and hope that even if the aims are commercial, for instance, to go back to the moon, particularly more so for China, when you consider how many countries outsource production of technology and cars and what have you to China, a lot of quite a few rare metals and uh, minerals are potentially and have already been identified on the moon. So even if your your reason is to go there for that commercial reason, when you look at some of the conditions, say, where children are being used in lithium mines, for instance, and, you know, our mobile phones or de smartphones depend on um, lithium batteries and what have you, if it means that eventually it might do away with a lot of terrible working conditions or child labour or, or it means that the earth is not going to be dug up in order to get the materials we need for our technology and that's going to be done off off, off Terran, you yeah. know, if it's going to um, be done planet, on the moon, yeah. then I see that as an inevitable future and you could almost say you know a sort of not quite a green one because you've got the sort of payback you know the cost of of getting people to the moon and back and what but the more you do it and the more you use like i've been to like european space agency labs where they're doing all these experiments on using regolith which is the word they give for the lunar dust and soil to use that to make um, we were talking everything. about it on the program a, a few episodes back, Zog, weren't we? Yeah, printing or concrete, yeah, effectively. You, yeah, uh, absolutely all sorts of things here where you would then actually eventually cut down on the number of times you would have to go there to the moon and back. So it's a really long-term project that I think is inevitable for us to both explore further than a mountain or a, an ocean or a jungle or, you know it's in our nature to explore and to find things and i don't see how the moon can be any different and i think it will be helpful both in terms of in employment in terms of technology in terms of the economy but also just for our nature as as human beings and then heading on further to 
Mars and beyond. We choose to go back to the moon and beyond that to form Starfleet. We will build a giant starship over 300 meters long, captained by James <laughs> T. Kirk. That's a speech I'd like to have heard him make. <laughs> so, do you think going to the moon is an Earth environmental necessity? I'm not sure that it's a, an environmental necessity. I think what you're saying there, so about you know this we're we're seeing the prospect of moving some manufacturing processes into space possibly is a fascinating prospect it's definitely a long term prospect but i'm an optimist you know i think we we will do that i think what will probably happen first in terms of anything to do with extraction and manufacturing in space is going to be related to Activity in space, you know, the, the, the first things that we extract in space, are go- yeah, we're going to extract water from the moon's surface, either for drinking water, for, uh, for the crew of a space station, mm-hmm. yeah, for, for, for oxygen and hydrogen, mm-hmm. um, and to make, to make rocket fuel. You know, one of the reasons that SpaceX uses methane in Starship is that that's a fuel that you can make on the moon or on Mars. But we have to get the cost of getting to and from wherever this manufacturing is happening way, 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 way down before we can realistically start, uh, you know, doing anything. If there were gold bars on the moon, it wouldn't be worth anyone at the moment sending a lander to the moon to pick up a gold bar and bring it back because the cost of doing that would be, you know, be considerably greater than what you'd get for selling the gold bar. But this then gets to the fact that we have to you know, do more of this and do better and we have to make progress. And and as you were saying, Sue, we have to we have to do this in different ways than we got to the moon in the Apollo era of a simple brute force, single rocket approach. Yeah, I, I'm an optimist. This will be, you know, th- th- this, we will be doing all this in the future. In the shorter term, I think seeing people doing wonderful things inspires everybody. It doesn't matter whether it's a Chinese citizen, an American citizen, a Russian citizen or a British citizen. It doesn't matter who they are. If you see somebody walking on the moon, visiting Mars for the first time, that's a hugely inspiring thing. Absolutely. Yes, we are driven to explore. And I think that those activities will continue to inspire people all around the world it's a, it's a it's a universal thing it's a universal experience a universal feeling so yeah let's push on let's let's do more of it and let's celebrate and support the, the people that are, yeah. that are doing that i'm not they're so doing sure it. about them i'm um, to be honest though my optimism is is more cynical is mars i don't think mars is the place to go to after after the moon i think it's, it's a tough gig it's a very tough it's gig too isn't it? difficult it's, it's... as all the wreckage of landers shown <laughs> shows yeah, strewn yeah, across yeah, the yeah. surface that atmosphere getting through that atmosphere yeah. it's hard enough without any human beings on board the problem with with the mars atmosphere the maths of landing on the moon is considerably easier than the maths of landing on mars and it like you pointed out it's the atmosphere on mars that is the problem because it's not thick enough to really no. slow you down to get from your interplanetary velocity to a landing velocity it's really hard whereas mm. on the moon you know you don't have to travel as quick to get there and when you get there it's a soft flump because low gravity no atmosphere use your fuel at the last minute we're good at that now you know but hey coming back to space is hard you know there have been some failed lunar missions Bereshit who again, I think they manufacture toilet paper, don't they? That was the Israeli... This is the Israeli one. Yeah, the Israeli lander that failed in, when was that, 2018, 19? They failed to do it. China are doing really good at landing on the moon. Japan has done some uh, clever stuff. They've got a lander coming up, haven't they? There's a new Japanese unmanned mission coming. Speaking of Uh, upcoming lunar things, can we just briefly maybe touch on the UK's involvement in upcoming lunar missions and lunar infrastructure. Please. Because I think it's the case that the UK is planning to put a communication satellite in orbit around the moon. So the UK will actually be contributing in a significant way to um, future lunar commercial 
infrastructure. I hope it's branded BT. That would be hilarious, wouldn't it? British Telecom in orbit <laughs> around the moon. <laughs> do, I mean, do, 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 do we know when that's likely to happen or um, how? I don't know the date. How concrete those plans are. I've heard about this, but um, but I haven't heard anything sort of more concrete. I've just remembered the name of that Japanese mission. Isn't it Slim? Yes. The next one is Slim. Yeah. The smart lander for investigating moon. Landing on the lunar surface uh, January the 19th, 2024. That's, that's well, the, the day after the show goes out, I think. Yeah. Or thereabouts. Wow. Yeah, it's next weekend, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, uh, watch that. Finished. Watch out for that one. So where were we? I interrupted you there. I do apologise. I was just saying that, as I understand it, you know, the UK is going to be making a significant contribution to the immediate future of lunar operations in putting a communication satellite in orbit around the moon. So that'll be something to look forward to. Yeah, that's going to be essential. You know, SpaceX are already talking about using Starlink as the lunar communication network globally. No, hang on. Yeah, it's still globally, even though it's the moon, because it is a globe, isn't it? Not the <laughs> globe. If you talk all over the moon, it's still global, isn't it? Is the... <sighs> That's a good one, isn't it? Well, yeah, that's the trick. I, I, I think there's a strong implication when you say global, you know, you, 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 there's a strong implication that it's this globe we're talking about, not yeah, some yeah. other globe out there. Well, yeah, okay. In that case, it would be uh, selenial, perhaps, or something like that. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, listen, where do you guys get your space news from? I get it from everywhere, but there are two presenters on YouTube, whose work I really admire. Hey, hey, Marcus has. <laughs> Can you guess what it is yet? We're going back to the moon. I love him. I love him. Do you watch Marcus House? He's very, very lovely. He's great. And I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Do you listen to Scott Manley? He's very good at talking about engineering and space in a very matter-of-fact way. Love him. But I, I guess you're a Tim Dodd fan, Zog, more than anyone, right? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I, 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 I do watch some of their videos. Yeah, absolutely. Tim Dodd, Everyday Astronaut. I'm a huge fan. I also get a lot of news from Space Boffins. It's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very, yeah. important, very important source. Well done. So when's the next Space Boffins? Fairly soon, I think. And in fact, we'll be covering the moon as well, obviously, with the Moonwalkers exhibition and Jerry Griffin's interview. Oh, I've got to go and see that. Mm. A friend of mine, do you know Stephen Slater, a friend of mine? He, um, oh, yeah. yeah he, we interviewed uh, him. Yeah. 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 Mad as a bottle of chips. Great friend of mine. <laughs> complete obsessive and world expert in NASA archive material. Oh, yeah. He's, he's very good. I mean, for, in terms of where I get my information, I... I tend to gravitate towards the direct sources. So we'll go to, you know, the actual websites of NASA and ESA and, and whatever companies. Oh, you're a proper journalist, you I'm are. I'm sorry. It's, 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 it's drilled into me. I like Jonathan Amos is so knowledgeable about it and BBC Online. And I like space.com, I think. Yeah, yeah. they're good, aren't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. Very much so. They're Very much superb. So. Oh, uh, Russian Space Web is very good. What's the name of the guy? Is it Anatoly Zak? who runs Russian Space oh, Web. Right, it's okay, rare okay. to get, you know, detailed information early from what's happening Andrew there. Jones. There's a journalist called Andrew Jones. been on the podcast. He's British. He's based in Finland, and he specialises... I mean, he covers a lot of space in general, but he specialises in China. Mm. So he's great for Chinese information. But it's funny, as the sort of, you know, the number of countries has expanded in terms of doing lunar missions well I, so we've mentioned just some of them like uae japan china india you know it, it it's incredible it, it's quite difficult sometimes to keep up yeah with all yeah it really it, is yeah it's really exploded uh, maybe exploded is not the right word to use when i'm talking about lunar missions but the actual interest and work and missions is it's a very exciting time well, you know what, Sue, we're going to have to have you back on at some point. We only just got started there. I've got, to, I've got to tell you this, right? Just before we went to air, Sue said, oh, I don't know if I'll have much to say. Like, <laughs> 40 minutes later or more. <laughs> that was amazing. And we have so much more to discuss too. Sue, will you come back or shall I come on Space Podcast and talk nonsense for you then? Or some, oh, or space either, either way. Either way is fine, fine yeah. by us. It's bound either to happen. Way is fine by Two things. My favourite space memory with you, Sue, was when we all used to go camping together with our kids when they were little. And mm. one particular night in a field in the Vale of Cluid in North Wales, we're all sat around the campfire and we're looking up. It's August and the sky's 
crystal clear. And I remember pointing out to you, Sue, that the very best thing about whales is it's in space. <laughs> you know, if you feel like you're there, you look up and there it is, there it is. And I, I remember you going, you've got a point, you know, because <laughs> we don't see clear skies like that quite so often. Okay, one last thing, Sue. Which is more exciting, doing a Vomit Comet low G experience or interviewing Tim Peake? <laughs> 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 As anyone who follows me on uh, Twitter will know, I, I've I've stalked Tim for a number of years. <laughs> I've got so many <laughs> pictures of me and Tim. I actually think uh, the two the two most exciting things I've I really loved going on a uh, centrifuge. Oh, uh, really? The oldest, yeah. The oldest one in the world is in the UK, and went on that, and that was fabulous. Mm. And I managed to do the G's that exceeded what you'd get if you were going up in the shuttle. And that was fabulous. Well, like 4G 4G or something? No, the shuttle is actually much smaller than that. It's something like 3.4 going up. We did 3.6, something like that. Well done. Uh, But me, my highlight was definitely going on, um, yeah, I know they're called Vomit comets but the, the the i can't even think now of the proper name for them i'm trying to think it was um a european space agency connected one where i went on board with scientists and did 34 parabolic curves of going Whoa. up really high and then 20 seconds of zero g or microgravity right at the top where you suddenly float up and then then you go down and that happened uh let's say 34 times and you are dosed up with like anti travel sickness stuff and what have you, but there were still a couple of poor scientists at the back of that plane who <laughs> never made it after years of working on their experiments, never made it past the sick bag. Oh. <laughs> it was amazing. That's the closest to space I've ever ever got i loved it fantastic fantastic and, you know meeting tim peak he's an exciting man <laughs> but... i you know i love him i love him i think he's fat he's so nice and so kind and he oh i've got to tell you this i'm okay. sorry i know i know we've overran is it I'm is it the, you know, no we've got time Look, hang on stop the music we'll extend the show again right tim peak is the most british astronaut since dan dare hello oh that's a great question oh well smashing i'm going to space it was, really went very well i'm gonna tell you okay i was at the science museum <laughs> and i was there for something a space related gig or what have you and it it was a bit more posh than normal in that they actually had because there were some astronauts attending and it was a dinner they had a red carpet which they never normally do but it made it really difficult inside the entrance of the science museum because normally as a particularly when you're doing broadcasting it's not like print where it doesn't matter what the sound quality is like because you're just going to write it down but if you're doing broadcast it's got to be clear yeah so it was a bit of a nightmare because you're beside other people all talking and it's like well you can't hear properly so i was fretting thinking oh i've got to do this and but there were also because there were astronauts there there were people there journalists there who had no clue about space how i know this was they kept asking me who's this again what's this oh, going to be oh no no who think? there was somebody so young that didn't even know about the apollo missions oh, i no. mean it was it was gobsmackingly and they looked at me and they obviously i just knew by the way they treated me they were just very dismissive that I was there because I, to them I just look like who's who's this middle aged woman you know who's here you know we're the we're the young and up and coming people but they didn't realise and then this was the best thing out um, as we're all waiting somebody said and what do you do I said oh I do science and space reporting and they go oh oh what's your name and I said Sue Nelson and they go, oh so yeah, I've not heard of you and I said well that's fine you know there's no need to um, I said but if you need any help let me know and they went yeah 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 and then went away <laughs> and then all of a sudden a voice went. Hey, Sue, Sue. And I turned around and everyone, and it was Tim Peake. And oh, went, come Sue. on. <laughs> and all of a sudden, all these people looked at me as if to say, what the hell? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> and then literally a few minutes later, there was another voice of, Sue, 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 how lovely to see you. And this woman, gorgeous green sort of silk evening dress, came up, gave me a lovely hub and walked away. And they said, who's that? And I said, oh, that's former shuttle astronaut, Nicole Stott. And they were like, yes! <laughs> I was just like the coolest kid in town. 
it was just serendipity and it was the best feeling ever. So for that, I will always love. And then the ghost of Yuri Gagarin appeared and said, <laughs> so comrade, great to see you. Actually, and there was, there was, I think, Charlie, I think I interviewed Charlie Duke there again and I have into, oh, I've actually Charlie had lunch Duke. with Charlie Duke. Yeah. So I've interviewed him before. I've had lunch with him, with a couple of other journalists and that was really nice because again, the others were going, who's that? Who's that? And I, and they just, I was going, that's Charlie Duke. Charlie Duke. I can hear <laughs> I can hear his voice saying, yeah, got a slightly southern drawl he's got, isn't it? Felt, I felt knowledgeable and, um, yeah, well that, that being recognised by two astronauts and Good. quite verbally was one of the coolest things that's, that's happened to me. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Uh, we're basically all addicts here and we're just sharing our experiences. So, okay, anything you want to share before we leave? Uh, well, I did, I've also met a, a handful of astronauts uh, ah. filming interviews of one thing or another. And, I mean, they're always extraordinary people. Yeah. They are so accomplished academically and very often physically they've, you know, they, they, oh, yeah. They're competing in all these in all these sports. They're involved in this outreach program with young people. Um, they did this PhD. They did that thing. You know, uh, you know, on and on and on and on. But they're also, you know, so uh, so lovely that you kind of don't begrudge them being such terrible overachievers. You know, you they are exactly that um, top guns. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but and, and and having mentioned Tim Peake, you know, one of my memories of him is, is he. It's a, you say he sort of tends to be quite very British and understated. Yes, absolutely. I mean, he's a um, he's a l lovely guy. But I was putting together some video for a space museum, and I was collating sound bites of astronauts talking about Soyuz reentry and what it's like coming back to Earth in a Soyuz capsule. Oh yeah. And they would say things like, "Well, it's it's it's, it's kind of like being in a car crash," or. It's like being in a bad car crash. And, and, you know, somebody else said, it's like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel while it's on fire. <laughs> and, and Tim Peake's comment was, it's a very dynamic experience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Well, and now, 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 now there, speaks, there speaks a test pilot who is not going to be rattled by anything. You know, yeah, OK, there's all this stuff is kind of exploding and falling apart around me. Oh, Great. That was, that was a very dynamic experience. Yes, no, carry a... on. Press the right buttons. Listen, we've got to wrap this up, guys. So thank you. Say goodbye. Hey, goodbye. So it's fantastic having you on the show. So thanks a lot for oh, doing this. Yeah, let, let's do it again soon. Let's do it again soon. Yeah. Goodbye, everybody. Watch out, Sue. You just earned yourself an invite back love you girl thank you very much indeed live long prosper nobody can see me but i'm doing it back of course you <laughs> are of course you are we all are Falcon salutes so long guys bye bye oh next episode of gareth jones on speed let me tell you this we are returning to old school gareth jones on speed we're recording a brand new episode in the old school style it will feature in my living room some pizza, some beer, Zog, me, and the return of Richard Porter for a one-off Gareth Jones on Speed special. See you in two weeks' time. Say bye, everyone. Bye. 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 For information on how to contact the show, see pictures, get song lyrics, follow us on Twitter, find our Facebook fan page, or to sponsor the show, go to GarethJones.tv. Gareth Jones on Speed is made in London by Wizbang. Gareth Jones on Speed! Speed!